that the entire body system is being controlled by the brain. So whatever we do in life, be it physical, intellectual, emotional, whatever you think possibly human does in life is being controlled by the brain. However, it functions like a simple computer. It receives information, process the information, and direct the body, different part of the body, what needs to be done based on the information it receives. As such, we can say is the master organ of the body because it controls the entire activities of the body. And we have to appreciate how God designed the brain with the billions of the cells and a lot of networkings from one part to another, to another, to another. And this information has been processed in fraction of seconds. First, think of whatever you are doing in life is being controlled by the brain. And I think I, I summarize what brain does to the body. Thank you. We have been discussing drug abuse and addiction. Dr. Shoot, in a simpler time, time, can you tell us what is this drug abuse? What happens to the brain? Yeah, it's. Uh similar time we from the presentation we understand that there can be another substance or psychoactive substance when we say drug uh, these are chemical substance either synthetic uh, natural or manufactured that is used to treat to eliminate uh, diseases but here are most important is the issue of psychoactive substance. Uh, I'm very much interested in psychoactive substance because these are substance, either chemical, either synthetic or natural substance that act primarily on the central nervous system or the brain in order to alter the way we think, the mood, the feelings and the behavior of that individuals. So after being understanding this concept, it will be very good for you to understand that when an abuse is coming is as a result of when individuals use this drug, when it is not prescribed, or when it's used that drug as against uh, the medical advice. So that's an abuse in a simpler form. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shinti. Going back to you, Dr. Bella. Uh, can you tell us in the simpler time the physiological basis of addiction? We take drugs or people take drugs, then what happens to the body system? Um, okay. I think we have learned what addiction is all about from the presentation. Um, but in the common, let me say in a layman definition, is having not control over taking, using, anything to the extent that it will cause harm to your system. So that is what we refer to as addiction. So, um, physiologically, we have two components. I want to simplify, as I said, for the sake of the audience. We have what you call the neurotransmitters, and we have the neuropsychic. Now, if we have, we have our phones, if we are privileged to open our phones, we we'll see a lot of connections from here, here, there, and there. So these neurotransmitters are chemical. They are like chemical messengers. And they are secreted when there is need for any actions to be performed by the brain. As such, we have different types of neurotransmitters. I had of mentioning dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, gluten, we have many and they are acting in different ways. So, alteration in the neurotransmitters as well as the neuropsychic. 
We can see brain here displayed. We have different part of the brain from the frontal to the middle to the back and inside. So all these areas of the brain are connected and we call them like neuropsychics. So when there is alteration in this neurotransmitter secretion, as well as the performance or the function of, it will affect the neuropsychics. And therefore, the alteration of the neuropsychics would now result in addiction. Addiction has three stages. A kind of preoccupation, like your anticipation. So usually it's controlled by the frontal. Now the frontal is being linked to an area of the brain, like tegmon, let me say the middle part of the brain. And from that, its control is also linked to another inner side, like limbic system is more inside. So the anticipation to have, like preoccupation, is controlled by the part, first part. Going is linked to the middle side. That is when the intoxication occurs, by the time you have that kind of feeling. And finally, if you want to withdraw, then the effect usually comes. So, so in generality, or in simple way, it's just alteration in the function of the neurotransmitters, secretion and function, and as well as that of the neuropsychic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bella. Uh, it's a common knowledge now that drug abuse and addiction is becoming rampant, even among students. Dr. Bafi, can you highlight uh, this? What are the causes? based on the observations as the dean student affairs? Uh, first, permit me to start on the existing protocol, please. First and foremost is the issue of the family. Uh, I'm sorry to say, whether we like it or not, uh, there is a way saying that uh, we, now, now, now that we have medical professionals here, it is natural to inherit your father. If your father is diabetic, he's a whatever, they will ask you in the hospital if this is it. So uh, we have a similar case. We ask somebody, why are you smoking? And he replied to us, because his father and mother are smoking. So this case, what will you do with him? So the first and foremost thing is family. Whether we like it or not, the family has to stand on their feet and has to um, uh, monitor their work. And then the second thing is uh, the environment that you find yourself. Because most of the cases we have, we ask somebody, where, where are you from? From the moment he tell you it's from so -so and so, so place, you don't, you know the conclusion. So the first and foremost is family. Second is issue of uh, environment. Then issue of peer group, the friends. Some of us, some of the students want to feel among. They want to be carried along. So what they want to feel among sometimes, whether we like it or not, uh, they want to feel among, they want to be on top of their classes or whatever. The last but not the least is the twins issue of uh, ignorance and poverty. Whether we like it or not, if you are ignorant, definitely you will be poor. And if you are poor, you also be what? Ignorant. So and this is it. Thank you, Thank sir. you very much, Dr. Shita. Any more factors? Yes, thank you very much. I think he has mentioned most of the factors. Uh, one of the factors is the issue of genetic. The genetics play a very important role in people coming down with uh, substance use. And that's why you see that in some areas, which I don't want to mention names, you see that the father, the mother will be using substance, and then the student grow up too. They might be smoking, as simple as smoking. Because they've seen their parent doing that, especially the father. And most of this thing, the genetic loading, when it comes to substance, is very high. I think it's as high as almost 60%, just like depression, which is almost like 40%, anxiety 40%, and then autistic spectrum disorder, almost like 80%. So genetic play a very major role in people coming down. And likewise, the environment too. The environment play a very major role. And it is an interplay between the genetics and the environment, which the person finds himself. And then one of the factors which I see in the presentation is this availability of this substance. You see that these substances are made to be much available. And from the presentation, you understand that Gombe is serving as a hope for this substance. Because what a study that I've done a survey of drug use in 2018, they found out that Gombe in the North is supposed to be the highest uh, with prevalence of substance use. So that means we are sitting on a time bomb and we don't know. And that's one of the things that we need to look at it that way. And I'm looking at it in the other way is acceptability of their substance. People tend to accept it. They see as it's a normal thing. If the father uses it, the father, the, if the parents use it, and other colleagues also use it. They see as it's a normal thing. 
and these are things that may likely increase, I mean, comes and bring out the etiology of substance use. So. Thank you very much, Dr. Shito. Uh, Dr. Aboki, usually pregnancy comes with changes in the normal body system. And uh, what will be the impact of drug abuse and addiction on pregnancy? Thank you. Um, permit me to stand on the existing protocols. I'm privileged to be part of this uh, important gathering. So, um, yeah, it, uh, yes, it's rightly said that um, pregnancy comes with a lot of changes in the body system, and this may vary from one woman to another. And then um, different women may have different uh, perception of it. So some of these common changes include um, nausea, vomiting, which we commonly refer to as uh, morning sickness, body pains, frequent urination, headaches, um, leg swelling, and then several other changes. So these changes may not interfere with her daily activities, trying to take care of the home, take care of the older children, and then cope with her place of work. So some of these women may now resort to abusing drugs, especially painkillers, smoking, marijuana, um, alcohol ingestion, and then many other um, illicit substances. So um, some of the women may know the impact, while some may not even know the impact of these medications on their pregnancy. So some of the impact of these uh, medications on the pregnancy, especially on the woman now, will include um, miscarriages, she can bleed during the pregnancy, she can have um, premature, because some of these substances can cause um, um, contraction of the uterus, so she can go into preterm labor, she can also have um, premature separation of the placenta, which can cause excessive bleeding, leading to, death, uh, to the death of the woman or even the, um, the unborn child. Also, um, the drugs can impair the function of the placenta, leading to narrowing of the blood vessels that supply the baby with uh, nutrients and oxygen. So the baby is at risk of poor growth, also at risk of um, dying inside the mother's womb. The baby is also at risk of uh, bad defects, what we call um, congenital uh, anomalies. And if the baby is lucky to be delivered alive, the baby may develop um, withdrawal symptoms because the baby is already used to these drugs inside the mother's womb. So not having um, the exposure to same drugs after delivery can now um, lead to withdrawal symptoms in the baby. And the baby might, might even die immediately after delivery. So. Um, so, uh, so some of the babies, after growing and then enrolling in schools, they may have um, learning difficulties. And the mother may still be wondering why her child is not doing well in school, not knowing that it's all as a result of the impact of these medications on the child. So I would like to advise all mothers out there that we should try to be very careful with the kind of things we take during pregnancy, as, it, as this can have very negative um, impact on our own health and the health of the unborn child. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, much Dr. Abuki. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Shutu, you heard what uh, Dr. Dr. Farida said and what Dr. 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 Bafi said. So how can we mitigate this in a sentence or two? Yes, in a sentence of one or two, I think based on what she said, I think the early education is very important. And one of the factors that we mentioned is ignorance. And that's why this program is very important. We're creating awareness to people. And the creating awareness will start with students and then uh, even from the primary, secondary, and even from the to the tertiary institution, that people should know the menace of substance use. And then it has affected so many things. Even the academy performance of that uh, individuals. You understand with her, she said that when, you, when the child grows up, and then you expect the child to perform very well. But you got to the point that you're getting a shock of your life. The child is not doing what he is expected to do. And then this is his role of maybe substance use or outcome of substance use. And to manage this, uh, to manage this problem, I think the early antenatal care is very important. And the mother education is very important. And then the, also the government uh, at individual level, and then even the parents also have a role to play by teaching our, stu our students how to do, uh, how to, uh, Believe well, even as true. And as some of the gadgets, the gadgets that we buy to our children, too, they may influence them because a child will be playing with some things and then you see them. I have seen a patient who had a problem and nobody wanted to get him uh, to, to talk to him. It was difficult to talk to him. But when I came in, I saw him and I saw the head. He was having some dreadlock all over. And I quickly remember Mali. And I began to sing songs like, one love, keep us together. And if, before you know, 
the person, the client, just came out. I began to play guitar. I began to uh, socialize around. And this person that found it difficult to do that, but because of uh, the way we rapport, also play a, role, a major role. And this person was able to break the, bag, uh, the barrier that we were having, and then we were able to uh, treat you, and you got better from the experience. So rapport is very important. Educating our, uh, our family members and peers is very important. Uh, this uh, awareness that we are creating, I think, is very, very, very important. And I uh, give the kudos that we continue this. And also, the government also have a role to play. Sorry, the government has a role to play. Like here in Gombe, we have described the prevalence of substance use almost 14 percent, which is not small. And then the burden of substance use is very high in Gombe. But look at Gombe. If you go through Gombe, you see the only functional unit that is here in Gombe is in specialist hospital. That is a psychiatry unit. It's not even a depart I mean department in Gombe. Although we are trying to replicate similar in the FTS Gombe, so that we can be able to create uh, a department. But the building is so much. The personnel are even very few. You have one or two psychiatrists in the whole of Gombe with this highest level of burden. And there's no rehabilitation center, no very functional unit. And even the staffs too, they are very under uh, staffs. The level of uh, nurses are very few. And um, some of them that are even available, they have almost retired also, they are about to retire. So the body is very, very much. And I've felt at this juncture, if the government will come in, and then they are the one that will help to medicate this problem. By the time they come, and then policy making too, will go a long way to medicate this problem. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much Dr. Dr. Shetu. And, uh, and of, course, of course, we all know it is a common knowledge that uh, drug barons are very rich, powerful, powerful people that have backings at some quarters. As somebody from the academia and then a former legislature and then currently special advisor to the government on political matters, do you think there is a need for policy making in the Northeast? And if yes, how can it be done, Dr. Mohamed Bello? Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, let me start by making an, uh, an observation. You see, by the time you sent your letter to me, I was special advisor to the governor of Gombe State on political matters. But we are all aware that the cabinet has been dissolved. Therefore, I'm here as former special advisor, former legislature, and now academic. Before somebody will go and report me to his excellency and say, hey, what do you mean that doesn't want to leave his seat? Uh, I would like to have a review briefly before responding to your question. When the governor of Gombe State, Alhaji Muhammad Uno came on board in 2019, he constituted a transition committee. And in the report of the transition committee, he realized that Gombe was fought in terms of drug abuse in Nigeria. That was 2018 report. And he received this report in 2019. It was based on this issue that uh, Governor Mohamed Uyunwaya appointed special advisor on narcotics, a former SDS, that is State Director of Security, former DSS officials official and uh, a lot has been achieved within these four years one is there were farms that were cultivating in Denham in Philia Degree and that in Kowa. all these cultivations have been stopped by the government the government was able to arrest some and prosecuted some and uh, regarding drug barons, some of them were arrested and prosecuted. Some of them fled. Some of them voluntarily stopped dealing with uh, drugs. And regarding the drug uh, abusers, a rehabilitation center has been uh, constructed near the Federal Secretariat. And a number of communities have been taking their, their sons and daughters for rehabilitation there. And uh, there is a skill acquisition center in that place where they are learning tailoring and other, other skills so that by the time they are out, they will serve as, uh, they will be productive to their own 
community. As at 2023, I want to believe, even though we are yet to get the report of the transition committee, but there is a plan to review what transpired in Gombe regarding drug selling and drug abuse for the past four years. In the next two or three weeks, the transition committee will be ready. And I believe, had it been the NDLA staff is here, or the commandant is here, he can maybe give a brief assessment that yes, Gombe had served, had, it's not serving now, had served as a pushing point, a hub and transit for drugs. But I'm telling you that after prosecuting these drug barons, a lot of them have fled and states, neighboring states, especially Borno and uh, Yobe have been positively affected. Positively affected, what I mean is now the quantum of drugs moving to these two states has dropped. This uh, achievement was done in collaboration with the sister agency, that is NDLA, NAVDAG, Emir of Gombe, Emir of late Emirs of Funakai, and then Emir of uh, Aku. They were all critical stakeholders, and they were able to visit a number of primary and secondary schools. They were in Federal University of Kashiri. They were here in uh, Gombe State University. As at now, and uh, as a former legislator, I can authoritatively say that we don't have a law on drug abuse in Gombe State. And I want to believe that it also applies to the neighboring states in this northeast uh, sub-region. But uh, with this kind of forum, I want to believe, even though I'm no longer in government, I'm now an academic, but uh, it will be wrong for us to call the attention of the House of Assembly and to call the attention of uh, the state government to make a policy that uh, will help in curtailing uh, the, the supply and consumption of drugs in Gombe State. And uh, I believe if the parents will come in, like what uh, Dr. Bapi rightly said, if the parents will come in and uh, the, the school, the traditional rulers, and uh, a tax force can be uh, constituted to monitor the selling and consumption or taking of these drugs, I think uh, uh, it will help a lot. Therefore, I believe policy making is, uh, let me say, urgently needed by Gombe State government and other, other states within the Northeast sub-region. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. That's why it's good to have somebody from the academia that will go into the political space. Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions, uh, Dr. Shito, about uh, mental health uh, disorders. So, what are these mental health disorders? Thank you very much. Uh, the misconceptions are very much, and time will not permit me to say all of them. But one of the misconceptions about mental health is people tend to believe that mental health is that um, it's just some certain people that are vulnerable to it. That means some people are immune to it, they can never come down with mental health problems. And the truth or the fact about that is nobody is immune for mental health disorders. I mean, at any time you can break down, especially when you have those genetic uh, burden or vulnerability to those things. Are mental health disorders, so you may likely break down and then uh, come down with a disease or a sickness or disorder. So nobody is immune to that. There's, it doesn't follow that this certain kind of people have uh, susceptibility and certain kind of people they may not have. That's a wrong misconception. And one of the misconception, misconception about substance, uh, mental health is also that um, that there's no treatment for it at all. And you understand even the tradition is based on imposition, very beautiful presentation. There's so many prayers and so many requests and other things that have been helpful. And even in the churches, prayers too has been helpful. And 
drugs also have gone a long way to help people with mental illness. The, the person I mentioned, I cite an example, was somebody who was purely psychotic. But because of the use of some uh, drug, he was able to live a normal, if not normal life, just almost normal life, and became well again. So drugs are very, very much helpful, and treatment is also helpful. So, and then one of the, also another misconception about uh, mental health is that uh, people who have seizure or epilepsy, people who tend to believe that if a person is having epilepsy, that when you go close, close to him and then you hold him, maybe the saliva touch you, that you, ma, you will get <laughs> the, the, the disease. I'm here to dispel that. So this has shown that none of that. I think the only thing that you can do to that person when at the time he's jacking is just to move things around that you may likely enjoy him. And then it's just episodic, it's just time bound. With this short of time, the person will come back normal and then it will stop the jacking. So you don't need to run away, please. You don't need to move away. But just look at a place that is very comfortable and lying down. It will go and then it will, it will go over. And these are some of the misconceptions about uh, mental health. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Shetu. Uh, what, what Dr. Shetu said, said, said is that nobody is immune, immune and, we and we need to help mental health patients. Dr. Bala, now that we understood that mental health has no treatment or cure per se, how can we keep our mental state in a very good state now? Um, well, there are many ways per se. <coughs> Um, we can maintain good mental health, maybe just to mention a few. Um, I, want to like to, um, I would like to start with this very important one. It's very good to have somebody you trust that you can discuss your issues with. Most of the times we keep things to ourselves that we cannot be able to solve. And Keeping things to ourselves alone over a long period of time will lead to some certain um, 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 uh, lot of disturbance in your brain. So, so the first thing is get somebody you trust you. Whenever you have an issue that you yourself cannot solve, talk to that person. It relieves a lot of things from your head. I believe some guys or some ladies will tell you when I'm somehow offended or somehow if I talk to somebody, I get a bit of relief. That's very important. Secondly, we need to take care of ourselves actively. Physical activities, exercise on a daily basis helps a lot in maintaining mental health. Also, we shouldn't joke with our nutritional status. We need to have, if we can afford, a kind of a meal or so, let me say something that will improve our mental stability or will enhance our mental activities. Now, in addition to that, there are so many environmental factors of which some have already mentioned. We shouldn't abuse. You shouldn't become abuser from user. You start using something, it's working for you, but don't abuse that particular thing. Once you abuse, it will affect your brain. And I think that is one of the things we are discussing here. Most of us use things. Now, a typical thing, let me cite an example of this. This is a color note. It has some certain chemicals. I can use color note, but I shouldn't abuse color note because I can become addicted to color note. And once I didn't get color note, I will be totally disturbed until when I get color note. So it's good that we shouldn't abuse whatever it is at our disposal. Um, as I said, a lot of other drugs around, um, we, we shouldn't go close to this. And as I said, there are quite a number of things that we need to do to maintain our mental health, maybe just for the sake of time. This is just few to mention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Maaz, you have been sitting for quite a while. Uh, of course, uh, we know that the health and economic burden of mental health is enormous. And uh, of course, I had Dr. Shi to say that it is in specialists that we have a unit that we can call psychiatrist, psychiatry unit. Do we have adequate resources of facilities to manage mental health in our tertiary institutions here in Gombe? 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, permit me to stand on existing protocol. Um, honestly, as he said, in the whole of Gombe, uh, we only have one department of psychiatry which is responsible to handle mental health issues, including drug abuse. Um, but that, that department has 40 beds, 20 for male, 20 for females. And I can tell you that the department is as old as the hospital. The hospital was established in 1958. And since then, that space is still 40 beds for patients to be admitted. And you can agree with me that um, the population, if we assume that only people from Gombe are using that particular space, for, uh, as at that time, the population at most 1.5 million. But now, you know, I think the latest population of Gombe State, the population is almost 3.4.7. So you can see that the population has almost doubled or tripled, but the space remains 40 bed capacity. So it means the space is not adequate. So we don't have an adequate space to manage or to handle or accommodate these uh, patients. And the implication is that so many patients that you will want to admit and manage as inpatient cannot be admitted. It means so many patients will be asked to go back home, perhaps come back. That may mean prolonged recovery time more resources to be spent and the patient cannot get the best. And sometimes you just have to, you know, discharge a patient because you feel it's relatively okay so that you can admit another person. So this issue of space is a serious challenge and is not adequate to handle a patient with mental health issues, particularly the drugs. The second aspect is that management of um, drug dependence and abuse usually take two phases. One phase is to manage the acute problem, while the other aspect is to manage to rehabilitate the person. At the moment, we can, act, we can only manage the acute phase, the, we don't, because we don't have an attached rehabilitation center to the hospital where this patient can be you know, admitted and then they can follow all the process. That is why we have a lot of relapse. Even if you manage acutely, there will be relapse. Secondly, in terms of equipment, there are so many equipments that you need to use to manage this patient. It's not adequate because um, little uh, statistics, we run clinics twice in a week and in the whole of the month, we are able to see like 1,400 to 1,600 are people, out of which 500 are new patients. And for you to evaluate this new patient, you need some, you know, items, you need some machines, you need some things to carry out some investigation, which are currently not available, like the EEG machines, the ECT, the cameras, even money. We don't have all those facilities. It means that second challenge is equipment and the machines. Then the third one, which I want to consider the most important, is the manpower. We don't have the personnel. With what we have, 40 beds and the clinics, on average we need like 26 trained psychiatric nurses to be able to handle the patient on the ward, ward rounds, and then serving medication, and also clinics. But at the moment we have only eight trained. So you see the gap is huge. So in, even in this regard, uh, the resources is not adequate. Of course, the manpower resources is not adequate. We need like four psychiatrists to be able to manage just this number. But at the moment, we only have one. And even the one is visiting. Likewise, psychologists. So I want to say we don't have, in, order, in all ramifications, if you look at the space, equipment, manpower, they are not adequate to handle what we have on ground. Okay, so yes. quickly, Thank how can we change the narrative still, uh, still if you can advise? Changing the narrative, I think um, I would like to borrow from the first speaker that I met, 
we need to put our hands together. Looking at mental health issues, these are issues that most of the time the victims cannot speak for themselves. So we really need to come together as stakeholders and form a very strong advocacy team so that we can talk to the government, policy makers, for what? For budgetary allocation and increase in funding as well as prioritizing this particular menace. Let's look at it as a public health problem so that we can actually give it the attention it requires. We will now have the fund to expand the existing structures and even build new, new structures like this rehabilitation center. We really need it and it requires a lot of funds. And of course, in terms of the equipment, these are things that you can actually procure. Once you have the, the budget allocation and it's released and you procure it, the next thing is the manpower, which is the most difficult thing. So we have to really look at you know, recruiting more people, training those that are on ground, and also creating a very good environment, as well as um, really good remuneration so that they can stay. And secondly, we need to have some innovations. Some innovation in terms of um, tax shifting where other healthcare workers can be able to really handle and also integration so that where we are managing physical illness like malaria and hypertension, we can equally manage, you know, the mental health issues side by side. Not this one that we are just managing it in a particular department so that we can refer to there is need for collaboration between the mental health expert and the other health workers so that these people, these services can be integrated. Thank, think, you thank you very much, much. Uh, Dr. Maaz. It was too explicit. Uh, mental health of women is another thing that receives minimal attention. Dr. Farida, what are the factors that affect mental health of women during pregnancy and after, and how can it be mitigated? Thank you. Yes, um, it's very true that uh, mental health of women receives minimal attention, especially in this our environment. And um, I know most people will agree with me that um, pregnancy and childbirth is one of the most important turning points in a woman's life. So um, some of these factors will include um, the existing mental health condition, as if she's already having a mental health condition before the pregnancy, so she can still carry that into the present pregnancy. Also, um, the normal changes of pregnancy, which some women perceive it as abnormal, can also affect her mental health. Also, um, if she also has um, complications from a previous pregnancy, she can carry the fear of that into the present pregnancy. Complications from pregnancy like um, miscarriages, bleeding, um, infections, uh, death of the fetus, diabetes, hypertension, developing in pregnancy, and the experience of uh, childbirth, the pains of labor and the difficulties. Likewise, um, after the delivery, she can have challenges with taking care of the newborn, taking care of her own self and also sleeping difficulties. She can have a um, problem with um, urinary continence, especially if she has sustained some um, fistula during the delivery. So if all this now is coupled with lack of adequate support from her partner, from the family members and the community at large, the mental health of that woman can easily get affected and she may come down with depression and other um, anxiety um, disorders. So. Um, so coming down with this depression and anxiety disorders can still further affect her own health and that of the child. So uh, mitigating the impact of these factors includes several uh, strategies, which include um, seeking antenatal care and then allowing room for open communication so that these women can voice out their challenges and their difficulties. Likewise, um, educating these women on the normal changes of pregnancy so that they don't get disturbed when they encounter such um, changes in pregnancy. Also, um, educating them on healthy lifestyle, uh, providing, um, providing emotional support, also uh, involving the partner in her care. Likewise, psychotherapy and medications in women with um, pre-existing mental health conditions can go a long way. In okay, thank you this. very thank much, you. Dr. Aboki. I think uh, before the exit of uh, President Mohamed Buhari, the former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, about two years ago, if I can remember, he signed the Mental Health Act, which was uh, thought to be a turning point in the management of uh, mental health. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Bello, how can we dom domesticate this Mental Health Act that was signed by Buhari in Gombe and not East? 
if possible. possible. Thank you. Uh, yes, it is possible because uh, I can remember when I was in the House, I was Chairman House Committee on uh, Housing and Transport. And uh, I realized that Gombe didn't have Gombe State Road Traffic Law. And that was why I sponsored Gombe State Road Traffic Law to complement and supplement the Federal Road Safety, Road Safety Act. What I'm trying to say is uh, the law enacted by the National Assembly is not an exclusive list, which means it can be domesticated in Gombe and all the other states in, in the Northeast sub-region. But the most important thing is the issue of collaboration between or linkage between the federal government and the state government. Just like what I said, the federal government constructed a rehabilitation center near the federal secretariat. I know the place. And uh, like some outpatients from the specialist hospital or some, uh, some drug, uh, uh, some abusers of drugs can be taken from their own community, which means there must be symbiosis relationship between the federal and the state government to be able to, to achieve this. Because there are some laws that you cannot enact or pass at the state level. But this is not uh, among them. So I think uh, the MD, the MD is here. It's a matter of calling the attention of Chairman House Committee on Health or maybe even sponsor a private bill. It can be done. Sponsor a private bill through the Chairman House Committee on Health. It can be passed. And I believe if the gov governor sees it, he will, uh, he will give it a go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Uh, we've, we've come, come to the end, end of the panel, panel discussion. discussion. Before, Before we leave, leave I would like, like to take advice, advice from, from each of the panelists, panelists to the uh, members, members of the public, public starting, starting with, with Dr. Dr. Bafi. In a yes, sentence or two, what will you tell the members of the community about mental health and uh, drug abuse? What advice do you have? Thank you. Not only issue of mental health. In whatever health issue that we have, I think uh, we need support. Uh, like uh, the MB is talking about government, government. We need not only government, even the, our, our philanthropists. Maybe somebody from the society that is CDG can come and uh, intervene build maybe a, a, a structure in the hospital and donate it to the state government. So individually, collectively, uh, group, associations, societies, we can cooperate, we can support directly or indirectly. Uh, 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 maybe ASU, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, ASU, I think just last week or last week, gave a scholarship to one of our students. So a union can decide to come and build a structure at the, at the, at the hospital and donate it to the state government, to the specialist hospital, that this is a psychiatric unit or whatever. So we need support individually. And this issue of mental health, uh, like what the doctor was talking about, we need a cooperation. Maybe the society, the family members, whatever support somebody can get from his, fa from his immediate family, from his extended family, from the community members, we need support directly and indirectly. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much Dr. Dr. Maazu. Thank you very much. I think I have um, one or two. One is that we should um, carry this... Uh, preaching to the society. We should all be ambassadors to preach this uh, uh, issue of mental health as individuals, as associations, as unions, so that to sensitize people to know that people that have a uh, mental health problem can utilize the resources available. They should go to the hospital or really meet the right people so that they can be treated appropriately. Then secondly, my call is to still the policy makers or on the healthcare financing aspect. Because one of the major challenges is that the people who go to the hospital, but they cannot afford the drugs, even if it's prescribed. So this is another area. And if fortunate, unfortunately, if you look at our NHIS and the state Go Health, you see that uh, some aspect of mental health has been excluded. They are on the exclusion list. The drug addiction, treatment of drug addiction, addiction is not covered by NHIS. So I think these are some areas that we may need to look at it 
so that we can actually reduce the financial hardship for people that are actually willing and have taken themselves to the hospital. Thank you very much. Um, I think when we collectively come together as one, the society, everybody has a role to play in one way or the other. We join our hands together, we'll be able to solve this um, menace, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shito. Yeah, I think, uh, let me see, this forum is very, very important, and I want to thank the organizer of this pro uh, program. Uh, I think it's a very well done job, because by the time you look at a collection of people here from different area, and if we can go out and sell this message that we've heard this morning, it will go a long way to spreading uh, a message about good mental health. And I want, secondly, I want to say, I want to restate that nobody is immune to developmental uh, problems. At any point in time, we may fall victim of this. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, I want to say, the issue of uh, procuring these medications, these drugs, you see that, uh, maybe this one is for the government too, uh, the issue of the drugs are very, very much uh, expensive. And most of the time, it's out of pocket uh, payment that people do to get the drugs. If there's a way that this thing can be waived through policies, we will lessen the burden on, uh, on our society. It will go a long way helping us to call these problems. And lastly, let it be a joint effort. Individual, family, society, the government, everybody must come on board so that we'll be able to cut out these menace of uh, substance use. Not just in Gombe, even in Nigeria as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Bello. Okay, uh, thank you. Considering the importance of uh, mental health emotionally and uh, psychologically, I see two things as very, very important things. One is the issue of advocacy. We need to know, and the community needs to know, that by taking drug A, it will affect you. Because some people don't even know that it will even affect them. Some will th are thinking that by taking it, they will just feel high because they have problem of maybe financial problem or family problem, or they just want to feel high. They want to belong to a particular group. They just do it. They don't know the effect. Then the second most important thing, in fact, is the most important one, is the issue of family. Parents are the most important uh, sector in terms of preventing and fighting against uh, drug abuse. Why? Because they are the first ones to realize their son is taking or their daughter is taking drug A or drug B. You normally see it. Teachers may not realize it quickly. Friends sometimes may not realize it, but because these people, usually the victims, are, 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 let me say, teenagers and what have you, based on the presentation of Prof, I think parents need to pay more attention to their sons and daughters with a view to preventing them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farida. Thank you. A lot has been uh, said already. So, uh, in addition, on my own part as a gynecologist, um, I would like to call on members of the public and also uh, especially those present at this uh, discussion to try our very best to show maximum support and care to women, especially during pregnancy and immediately after delivery. Because this has been proven to go a long way in improving the mental health of women generally at this critical period. So, um, seeking and sustaining a strong support system is very, very essential. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Uh, before we go, uh, initially the Permanent Secretary Minister of Health was here, but he had assignments to execute. I think he left. We will take one or two comments. Of course, we have a Professor of Public Health. Maybe when he comes for his remark, the Deputy Provost, he will discuss on some of the aspects. So, from the members of the public, one or two questions or comments to the panelists, if we have any. Okay, Professor Rashid, the Director of Academic Planning, Gombe State University. The presenter and the panelists, I just want to put my contribution in the form of a question, uh, especially for the specialist in the area of uh, mental health. 
uh, what do you think should be the role of religious leaders in the psychotherapy of uh, mental health uh, challenges? Thank you. Yes, uh, I think it's a very a good question, a very important question at this time. Like I said in the preamble, I say everybody has to play a role. Both the religious leaders, either the imams, uh, sheikhs, pastors, and so many other people, the religious body has to play, they have a role to play. Because most of this illness, you need to delineate at what time is it purely mental illness, and at what time is a spiritual illness. Um, I'm not a spiritualist, but uh, I felt you need to know at, at that time to be able to relate. And that's why even from the presentation of the patients, most of them will have gone through several ways, maybe consulting uh, other people before even getting to the uh, spiritual leaders. And I felt at that very moment when they come, you need to play a very important role. And uh, what role you need to play, let it be more of a religious inclined. Whatever nature of the faith, please practice it. And it has gone a long way that people even listen to their, their leaders. And then they listen to their doctors. That the leaders also play a very important role. That he mentioned say the support. They can ask through giving a psychosocial support or psychoeducation to their clients educationally and it goes away to help uh, the people and as well as morally too is very important people need to uh, thought how to behave and then what not to do and that's why we say at this junction that the religious leader also need to preach this thing in the churches and then the mocks about the millions of substance use the effects of substance use and how the 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 populace need to reduce or even stop use of substance. I think it's one good question and they go a long way when the religious leader uh, come together and then uh, put uh, their own effort to make sure that this menace is stopped. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much our panelists and uh, able contributors. Can we give them a round of applause? So this brings us to the end of the panel discussion. I will hand over to the master of the ceremony. Thank you very much.